My name is Brian Gracely. Uh, I run uh, marketing here at Solo. Uh, been with the company for about a year. So I'm going to spend about 15, 20 minutes kind of giving you guys a sense of, of who we are, uh, what we do, why our customers engage with us, what we do from a technology perspective. And then Christian's going to go in depth in terms of uh, some of the technology, some of the futures of what, we, what we're building last year and this year and, and things that impact this space. Um, Solo presented about three years ago. I, I looked, it was almost exactly three years ago on, on YouTube. Um, and the product space has changed quite a bit. The market has changed a tremendous amount in that space. So um, it'll be good to, to kind of walk through some of these things. So I, I want to start by not diving into who we are or, or what we do, but I kind of want to talk about why our customers engage with us, like the types of problems they try and solve. So I'm going to kind of walk through two stories. They both happen to be retail. Retail happens to be one of the verticals we engage around, but but not by any means specific. So customer one, um, uh, you know, US-based retailer, 2,600 uh, food operations, if you will, right? And pandemic comes along. Pre-pandemic, their business was driven by two things. People love their food and people love the experience of going into the stores. They love, the, for whatever reason, they were able to get a bunch of teenage kids to not be angst-driven and to be very friendly in terms of that. And people love the, love the experience. Pandemic comes along, you can't go in the stores. So half their differentiation is gone overnight, right? Um, Pre-pandemic, uh, they'd had a mobile application as many things do today. About 5% of their traffic went through that. Pandemic comes along and about 50% of that uh, is now going through the mobile application as well as I need to start engaging with partners that I never did before. Grubhub, uh, DoorDash, all of the delivery services because people didn't stop eating. They just couldn't go through the same way. So they engage with us and they basically say, look, uh, number one, we have to move, we want to move some of our operations into the cloud because obviously we can't get into data centers. We're going to be in the cloud. And we also have this sort of unique situation in which we have scalability challenges, but they're not necessarily like 10x scalability. They are six to eight scalability, 11 to one scalability, and five to seven. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner, right? So I want to be able to deal with 10x API traffic, I want to be able to do that on a, in a, into the cloud, natively in the cloud, and I want to be able to scale it up and down so I'm not paying uh, high rates in the hours in which people aren't engaging with us, right? So um, we'll talk about sort of where the technology was involved with that, but that's one example of the types of things that our customers come to us with. They come to us with our businesses evolving from a digital perspective. Uh, we have scale issues that we didn't have before. Um, and, oh, by the way, as we start to deal with these, these digital transformations, there are sort of side benefits and side unexpected things that we have to deal with. So in the case of this specific customer, they literally, so 2,600 stores, towards the second half of the pandemic, so 2000, or 2021, 2022, literally went from one drive-through in every store to two drive-throughs, tore up the parking lot, shut down the stores for a month, sometimes two months at a time, because as they were now driving 50% of that traffic through mobile, I know a whole lot more about my customers. I know that Sally comes in on certain days. She comes in Monday, Wednesday, Friday. I know that she comes in and seems to order what seems to be like four people's worth of food. I now know much more about her than I ever did when you came to the store, right? And so they not only changed what their technology stack looked like to deal with it, but they literally changed physical transformation to deal with what that looked like, better customer experience. So that's sort of the API management side of our business, an example of what that looks like. And there's a number of cases that look like that. On the service mesh side of our business, the sort of microservices, cloud native application side of our business is an example of a company who started off being a fairly small company. And basically they were doing same day delivery for a whole bunch of things that people shop for every day from dog food to beauty products to you name it, right? And, uh, Large, uh, large company Target acquired them uh, 2017, basically because Target said, there's another bigger company than us, Amazon, who runs this service that everybody loves and 90% of US households have this. I need my own version of Prime. And so this company went from a small niche thing to being the centerpiece of Target's essentially Prime fight back strategy. Now what that meant was, number one, uh, they, you know, they had to deal with a whole lot of different partnerships, which meant a whole lot of different kind of relationships, a whole lot of different applications they had to build because whether they were dealing with, uh, you know, partners, whether they were dealing with uh, different security requirements for different partners, whether they had to deal with different pricing things, 
So they're building a whole bunch of applications, a bunch of microservices, and they were trying to figure out how do I do that at scale? How do I keep it secure? When I deal with things that involve uh, you know, potentially government deliveries and so forth, do I have to do things like FIPS? Um, how do I do this when we're adding new development groups? So I don't necessarily know who's always developing these things. How do I do zero trust? How do I do multi-cluster scaling? How do I do uh, failover routing and you know, kind of complex stuff in a cloud native world? So they were sort of a prime example of somebody who was growing their business. Um, the demands of the week, the demands of the month were changing. So they were adding new applications, adding new partners, adding new services on a regular basis. And how do I do that in a controlled way uh, while still you know, continuing to get the benefits of, of microservices, the velocity of microservices. So kind of a, kind of a you know, prime example of the types of things that people that are building with service mesh, and Christian will obviously talk about this in more detail, the types of challenges that they're you know, coming to us with in terms of that's what my business looks like, this is where I think the business is gonna look like in a couple of years, how do you guys help me get, you know, get forward with that? So, um, a couple of years ago, Solo was here, I think around the time would have been 2019, 2020, about 35 people at the time. Uh, we're now about 180 people. We, uh, back in uh, fall of 2021, took a $135 million round of funding, billion dollar valuation. Um, so we've grown fairly consistently and fairly uh, large over the last year and a half. Um, we very much sort of live at the intersection between what our customers do today, so today's type of business, uh, lots of VMs, lots of legacy stuff, lots of monolithic applications that they'd like to modernize. And they come to us with, you know, we want to uh, be more competitive in our markets. We want to do digital transformation. We want to build microservices. We want to move to the cloud. We want to be multi-cloud. And they come to us for a number of reasons. One, uh, because the technologies that they've chosen, oftentimes Kubernetes, uh, they're building microservices, and they come to us because they go, well, the next thing that we need to do beyond that, you guys have expertise in. So as Christian will talk about, and I'll talk about a little bit, we have deep expertise around uh, Kubernetes, around Istio, around Envoy, around microservices. So they come to us for that. They also come to us because we've done a, a very, very good job in terms of not just bringing technology to the market, but also bringing education to the market. And I'll dive into that a little bit. So in essence, they'll oftentimes come to us and go, look, we think we know what we need to get going forward, I don't necessarily have all those people on staff. Can you help me with those types of things as well? And so we've trained over 10,000 people in the last three or four years in terms of those types of technologies. And then, you know, probably just as importantly is they oftentimes come to us and they go, well, we think some of these technologies in Istio and Envoy, Cilium are going to be relevant to us, but we've dug into those a little bit. We've begun to use, say, the open source projects. And we find that either we can't understand them or they don't do enough. They don't do everything we need. And so they come to us and they go, well, not only do you guys kind of have expertise in this, but you're leading in a lot of those communities. You're the leading developer, second leading developer, third leading developer in those communities. Can you help us move the projects forward? Right? We, we have unique requirements and you help us move the projects forward. And so we live very much in that space between engineering expertise, uh, leading edge open source projects, uh, and people wanting, uh, you know, wanting a partner as opposed to just a vendor to help them kind of move forward. Um, just to give you a sense when I talk about sort of the, the engineering leadership, the types of people that, that work for us and, and why people come to us, um, we'll talk about Christian, but you can see uh, Christian background from Red Hat, multiple years at, at Solo, Lynn Sun, one of the original uh, IBM fellows when Istio and Envoy were created. Uh, Niraj uh, actually had run one of the uh, alternative service mesh companies was the CEO and engineering lead, now runs our engineering. Uh, Yuval, who's one of the leading contributors to the Envoy project. Ram, who's on the Istio steering committee. Nick Nellis, who's one of the leading committers to Istio. Um, you know, so not just people that have been around this space for a long time, but people that are sitting on the steering committees, sitting on the technical committees, essentially helping to shape where the future's going, but also some of the leading committers to these projects. And so people can feel very, very comfortable that not only do we understand this space, um, but as we'll talk about some things, we're kind of pushing it forward. We're pushing Istio forward. We're pushing things forward. And this is sort of unique, right? A lot of these CNCF open source projects were started by Google and Google still contributes to them or Microsoft still contributes to them. Um, we've been able to, as a small company, uh, carve out a niche to be able to, to really sort of drive some of these projects where maybe some of the larger companies have been relevant before. Um, I, 
I say this kind of when, when people go like, well, what do you guys do? Like, what do your customers want? And this kind of goes back to the old adage that like at some point, every customer is, a, every company is a software company. And I know sometimes that sounds sort of niche but in terms of what, you know, if you think about, and I threw up a couple of examples of companies that, that we work with, um, you know, Ex American Express cares less about the physical thing in your pocket anymore. They care about, you know, how can I do as many digital transactions as possible, whether that's backend analytics to make sure that fraud prevention is not happening, that they can work with as many partners as possible digitally so you can get a, a Hilton card or a Ford Motor card or your favorite NFL team. Um, you know, people like Carfax who during the pandemic, when new cars weren't available, you know, they went from a billion and a half transactions in a month or in a year to two and a half billion, billion transactions or APIs in a, in a year to what's going to be almost four billion transactions uh, by the end of next year, right? Their businesses, even though Domino's or Chick-fil-A sells food at the end of the day, the experience that's more prevalent these days is the digital experience. It's not the front door, it's the mobile application. It's, can I tweet and get a, a pizza delivered to me? You know, what can I do? And so our customers basically come to us and they want us to help them better manage software. Their business is changing quickly. Their business is going through scaling up or down uh, that's different. They want us to help them better manage software than their competitors. Those are the things that are differentiating their business. So whether it's application modernization, zero trust, reducing costs through operations and automation, um, those are the things they ultimately come to us for as, as byproducts. But it's you know, software is going to change what our user experience is going to change what our differentiation is. Okay, so uh, NASCAR slide, um, just to give you a sense, a lot of times, depending on how much you live in this world, you know, in the Kubernetes world, in the cloud native world, sometimes you'll go like, eh, is this stuff real? I, I throw this up only for, for one reason. Um, it, you know, this stuff isn't specific to Silicon Valley. It's not specific to startups. As you can see, it's pretty horizontal across industries. It's pretty horizontal across geographies. Um, it's everything from, you know, uh, every time you cross the border or, you know, you come into the border, you're a plane, train, or automobile, uh, you swipe your passport, that goes through our technology. Whether it's, um, you know, uh, we mentioned some of the, the retail things, whether it's, you know, somebody like T-Mobile, who every time there's an iPhone launch has to be able to scale up for, X number of days has to make sure that you know every notification that for your tracking of where that goes, they can they can deal with those sort of scales. So it's you know it's across a lot of different industries, um, and we're very very fortunate that even as a small company, uh, these guys trust us with some very very critical applications. So um, wh what do we do on a regular basis? What are the things that are driving our business? So I, I think it really kind of boils down to these four things, right? The first is the maturity of Kubernetes. So Kubernetes has now been out there six years. We're seeing the velocity of features slow down, which essentially is telling us Kubernetes is becoming very stable. Uh, we're seeing thousands of companies are using it as now their de facto deployment, at least for new applications, and we're seeing more and more modernization happening. So what happens with Kubernetes as it becomes more mature, more mature is the next set of things that are challenges with that, and we'll talk about that. So um, very much one of the things that we see is people coming to us going, We've been doing Kubernetes for a couple of years. We've gotten very good at it. And now we have a new set of challenges. The second thing is, uh, you know, in the service mesh space, service mesh has been always sort of an, an, an adjunct to Kubernetes, right? It's once you figure that out, service mesh often becomes the next thing you need to scale, to do security, to do identity, uh, to offload and make developers more productive. One of the challenges of service mesh has partially been two things, or two, two challenges. One, what's the standard? Is it Istio, is it Linkerd, is it whatever? Um, Istio over the last year with it moving to the CNCF, um, with uh, you know Google um, submitting it, with seeing more and more companies adopting it, it's really sort of moved ahead of a lot of the other options out there. But the second thing, and more importantly, and Christian's gonna dive into this, the market kind of came back to us and said, you know, what Istio does today is fine for a number of use cases, but for another set of use cases, which maybe even bigger, it's too big, it's too heavy, it's too costly. And so we spent a lot of time, um, and Krishna will dive into this, really kind of simplifying what that looks like. So bringing down the cost of it, bringing down the operational uh, overhead of that. Um, so a lot of work around that, something called ambient mesh, uh, which is part of Istio, we'll talk about that. Um, the third thing, as we sort of go around the clock here, uh, we've seen this sort of trend, right? 
early on when we were doing microservices, the, the, the architecture and the use case was, well, we can put an API gateway in front of these things, sort of expose it the same way you did a firewall. And then as service mesh has all evolved and we've seen more and more microservices, those are essentially exposing APIs as well. So we start to get into this blurring of lines of what's a service mesh, what's an API gateway, is it an inside use case, is it an outside use case? And so we've begun to see those two technologies really sort of merge together. Um, and we've been kind of at the forefront of, of what the possibilities of that can look like. And then the last thing is really sort of the, the evolution of DevOps, of SRE, to what we're now talking about in terms of platform engineering. So um, I want to be able to deploy applications quickly. I want infrastructure to get out of the way. Uh, you know, which team is responsible for that versus what do we still burden the application developers with? And so trying to simplify that as much as possible. Quick question. Yeah. Would you say Solo is, you know, almost like the control plane of network components in your cluster? So whether you're, if you're trying to implement eBPF and you want to move off a of queue proxy, whether you're trying to implement a CNI like Cilium, whether you're trying to implement a service mesh, is, is, it, is that the idea? It's the, the, the level or the layer of abstraction on top of your networking and your cluster? Yeah, it's, it's, it's going to be both a control plane and a data plane okay. uh, piece of the, of the puzzle. And I'll sort of talk about that. But yeah, it's, we want to be able to say, look, um, regardless of how you want to do application networking, um, you know, how do we do that for outside types of use cases where API is, you know, security and APIs that inside types of use cases where we're doing zero trust, where we're doing multi-cluster routing and so forth. Yeah, we're a part of both of those. Got it. And is the idea to bring in other service meshes, other CNIs, or focus solely on, <laughs> pun intended, I guess, um, focus on, you know, a, a key key pieces? Yeah. Like, like Cilium, like... Istio. Yeah, so uh, we'll we'll get into it. We we do uh, we do do quite a bit of work. So, um, you know, at the core of what we do is is Istio and Envoy. Mm -hmm. uh, we're seeing more and more where people are interested in eBPF mm -hmm. in certain different kinds of use cases. Sometimes it's network acceleration. Sometimes it's a little higher in the stack. Um, Christian's going to dive into that in more depth. But yeah, we're not um, we're not sort of like uh, exclusionary to one of the, some of these trends. Are mm -hmm. we think sometimes. There are trade-offs between them, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we'll we'll dive into some of that. Good yeah, questions, go Brian. I have a question. Absolutely. When does a customer starts to think about Solo and not just Istio? I mean, Istio as a as an open source, there are many developers that start using open source, and yeah. at some point they need the enterprise experience. Yep. So, what is the difference, or what brings? You know, what sort of brings to, to, the, to their customer in the end? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to cover that in a couple of slides, but let me give you the, the real basics of it. Um, you know, Istio is not totally unique in the sort of open source to I need, I need help uh, use case. We, we've saw this with, with Kubernetes. We've seen this with Linux. Um, you know, typically what it is is, is a couple of things. Um, in some cases, it's just you know, purely skill set, right? We, we, need the, we, we need the technology, we can't keep up with the technology. So in the case of Istio, um, you know, Istio has one of the more frequent release cycles. So it's every month and a half, there's a new version or every two months, uh, that may be too fast for you, you can't keep up with it. So you're just looking for, uh, you know, I'm, I'm looking for uh, better lifecycle management. That's sometimes the case. In some cases, it's I can't keep up with CVEs, right? Because we're a bank and there's no way we're going to do upgrades every couple of months. So I want you guys to do that. Typically, what it what it boils down to is is a little more advanced stuff. So I want uh, more advanced security options in terms of authentication. I want more advanced options in terms of routing, HA, uh, you know, kind of failover types of routing and so forth. So. It's always somewhere in that spectrum that people tend to come to us and say, Istio was good for what I could figure out, um, but as we've moved from those first couple of applications to those first couple of clusters into something that's more production, more robust, you know, the, typically the feature list that they need or what they need kind of is, hits a wall and they, they need something more. Okay, yeah. good. Sure. Um, okay, so real quick, I, you know, I talked about a couple of the technologies. I want to kind of just give you a sense um, or even if you had gone back and, and watched the, the 2019 video that, that Christian and Adit uh, did. So our evolution looks a little bit like this. There, there are some other technologies we're involved with, but at the core of what we do is really these two. It's, it's the Envoy project, uh, the, the proxy project from Lyft and, and IBM, uh, and then it's Istio. So what we did with Envoy, and this was, this was the earliest part of the portfolio, we really decided that you know, Envoy was super powerful, uh, 
really scalable uh, and really modular, which made it very interesting for a number of use cases, especially as we looked at what else was in the marketplace, an Nginx, an HA proxy, some other things. Um, it was going to not only leapfrog them in terms of performance, uh, it was going to leapfrog them in terms of being native to Kubernetes, which was becoming this de facto standard, but the modularity of it gave us the ability to do a lot of interesting things. So in this case, we began by essentially extending it out to becoming an API gateway. So adding advanced routing, advanced authentication, advanced scalability, uh, control plane. Uh, we started getting into use cases that people were coming to us with. Oh, you know, I want to be able to potentially replace an AWS gateway, but I also need you to integrate with Lambda. Okay, did that. Uh, we're beginning to do uh, web assembly transformations. I want to be able to do that at the edge. Cool, integrated that. And then we started getting into some more kind of unique situations of people building uh, APIs using GraphQL and coming back to us going, boy, I'm always having to have a, a distinct server and then I have this other box in front of it that does sort of security for it. Um, you know, that seems like a lot of overhead. So we basically were able to take something like GraphQL, um, take the extendability model of Envoy and bring GraphQL native into that type of platform. So on the API sort of management API gateway side of things, Envoy's at the core of what we do. Envoy's at the core of the way we do policies and security, but we've been able to extend it based on a number of kind of common use cases we're seeing with people. The second piece of the portfolio, and this gets into sort of the control plane and data plane piece of it, um, you know, really gets into what we were able to do with Istio. So the first thing that we began doing was around multi-cluster management. It was people saying, I'm using uh, open source Istio, but what do I do when I've got multiple clusters? How do I manage policy consistently? How do I manage routing consistently? So we began by really looking at multi-cluster management. Um, we started adding uh, advanced security and networking. So this is where uh, eBPF starts to come into play. eBPF allows us to get into Cilium in some cases. Um, but also, you know, this is where having deep expertise in Envoy becomes really important because Envoy is obviously the data plane of, of Istio, right? So all the things that we've been able to do in terms of extending Envoy, we can bring that as native capabilities into, into the mesh. Um, we start getting into people asking us to support this across multiple platforms. So not just x86, but ARM across all the different cloud platforms, start to support it with FIPS so you can get into government uh, types of things. And then finally, just you know, basic things that that any open source based company that's commercial does, you know, building extend, uh, you know, extended life cycle. So, for example, some of the folks I showed you a couple of slides ago sit on the sort of security group for Istio. So we actually are able to get CVEs out literally instantaneously with what happens in the open source community, and then have you know four x the uh, extended life cycle of what Istio does upstream. So if you're a customer, you get the benefit of I can run it anywhere I want to. Um, I can, you know, I can save costs and stuff. But then, when there's problems with it, I'm going to get better support than the community provides at much longer intervals and cycles. And so, what what that ultimately lets us do is we can go into customers, we can go into the marketplace, and say, look, uh, and these these little icons come back to that thing I talked about before. No matter where you're starting with this portfolio, you know, I can I can help you with digital transformation. I can help you with security. I can help you with cost savings, and especially the way the markets changed over the last six to twelve months. You know, we've gone from this super innovative, super you know kind of move forward thing to, oh, security is more important now. We're going back and solving technical debt. Oh, cost savings is more important to us. Our budgets got slashed by thirty percent, but we still need to do certain projects. So the fact that we were able to reuse a lot of the technology across the architectures gives you know gives us the ability to go to the market and say, you know, there's quite a bit that you can do uh, with what we do. So in terms, of, in terms of products and technology, just you know, so you know the things that Christian will talk about, um, early, early sort of days of the company, uh, API gateway product was called Glue Edge. Uh, the mesh product was called Glue Mesh, um, again, based on Istio and Envoy. One of the things that we were hearing over and over again from customers, and I talked about this a couple of slides ago, we were seeing more and more use cases where people were saying, hey, the you know where the mesh ends and where API management starts and stops is kind of blurring together. Now I may start in one place and move to another, but really what I want to get to is I want to have consistency of control plane and consistency of data plane across any of these. And so what we launched uh, this last fall 
was really the the integrated pieces of these you know so so not just individual products with somewhat different control planes and so forth but uh, a completely sort of integrated stack modular integrated stack we call glue platform so what that means is if you start with any of the pieces of that so gateway obviously provides us uh, edge gateway functionality with integrated graphql if you want it uh, mesh is still service mesh Glue network is where EVPF or Cilium comes into play as a CNI and as a you know a proxy technology, and then Glue Portal allows us to deliver you know self service capabilities and, and API management. But what it means is, any product that you buy, any starting point that you have, in essence, you have the platform kind of built in. Same way that if you buy an Apple product and then you buy another Apple product, they just know about each other. You didn't have to go and be like. Oh, what's that integration I got to buy to make my phone work with my, you know, Apple TV and with my Mac? They're just sort of there. So, um, you know, what I talked about in terms of use cases has been what's been driving our portfolio the last couple of years. Uh, we like to kind of call the last four or five years, and I know people hate numbered acronyms and things like that, but you know, the the first five or six years of of Kubernetes saw a couple of things, right? We saw a lot of open source projects, which was great, lots of innovation. Um, we've seen it sort of expand out. If you look at the CNCF landscape these days to the point where it's it's almost just an eye chart. So if you're a customer, you're going, which one do I pick? What do I pick? Um, so we've been very we've been very proud of the fact that we've not only picked very good projects, but also helped drive a number of projects. Um, what this sort of means is this. People are figuring out, have figured out, you know, how do I get to the public cloud? How do I begin to do containers? How do I begin to do Kubernetes? And they do certain things well, right? They've, they've, you know, we see lots of companies who go, ah, the first couple of projects that we built were successful. We proved out that we could do this stuff. We proved out that we could do CI and CD. We've proved out that we could deploy once a day as opposed to once a week or once a month. And then what happens is they get to that third or fourth thing or 50 microservices or two clusters and they go, uh-oh, we got a new set of challenges, stuff that we didn't necessarily plan for. Uh, how do we scale? The number of clusters, how do we scale APIs and manage those things? How do we start to do stuff with modern operations? So like, how do we bring this GitOps stuff into play? Um, and this is really sort of what I call Cloud Native 2.0, right? A new set of challenges that have come because that base foundation thing got stable. People figured that out, right? And this is the same sort of thing we've seen with, with every technology evolved, right? If you went back to 2007 VMware, it was like, oh, how do I just stick something in a VM, then it became, how do I do super VMs? And then how do I do multiple clusters of VMs? Same sort of things have happened with Kubernetes, right? We've seen baseline success and new challenges come along. And you know what the challenges are, we can kind of walk through them. You guys can go back through and read through these things. But to the point of when do people engage with us, it really is that sort of you know second second phase of what this is. I want to start monetizing my API management. I want to, you know, I want to be able to uh, charge my customers, my partners for accessing data. I want to be able to scale microservices. I want to be able to to do zero trust. Um, I want to be able to deal with multiple clusters. Right? We'll have clusters. Yep. Yes. Okay. Because I'm getting confused because the eye chart like blew my mind. So now go back to the glue, thing, please. So is the glue platform solo IOs product? That's our product. Okay. So our so glue is glue is our. Uh, is our, our brand for the product. Is it the brand and is it an open source thing because it sounds so open sourcey or is this proprietary? Product? So it is, um, it's all based on open source. So I'm going to try not to get that outside the lines. Glue Gateway based on Envoy, Glue GraphQL based on GraphQL, uh, Glue Mesh based on Istio, Glue Network based on Cilium. So at the core of them they are. What we do in, so, and there are open source projects associated with each one of these. So you with can- the glue? With Glue, yeah. So if you go on Git, so if you go on Solo's GitHub page, you will see Glue projects. There are open source versions of all of them, and then we do uh, a number of what people sometimes would call open core uh, features that we add above and beyond that. So there are some commercial features that are only in the commercial product, right? So, um, but yeah, at the core, they're all open source. The APIs are all you know based on the open source project APIs. And then we do some extensibility thing uh, in the commercial okay. pieces of that. Yeah, good question. Um, so I'm going to wrap up with this real quick. So I talked a little bit about, um, you know, how do we help companies who need the technology, they need the business changes, but you know maybe they don't have all those people. Um, we launched something. We made an investment many years even before I got here. 
And we basically said, look, um, we have a whole bunch of expertise. We need to be able to share that. Uh, we're based on community-based things. We need to be able to do that. So uh, Solo Academy is something that um, anybody can launch, anybody can go into for free. Uh, we host hand -on, hands-on workshops two to three times a week, but you can also go in and just uh, you know launch it and learn about it. So we've had more than 10,000 people over the last couple of years go through the program. We've had more than 4,000 people get certified on Istio and EVPF and Envoy and ambient, uh, ambient Mesh and other things. So we've been very conscious that you can't just put technology out there and hope and pray that the customers are gonna figure this out. You've gotta be able to, to hold their hand. You've gotta be able to help move them along. And, and we're very proud of, of how that's grown.